I'll also start the uh, uh, streaming on YouTube. Of course, yes. Thank you very much for setting up the seminar series. I've been watching a few of the YouTube lectures. Uh, very nice. Thanks. Yeah. Are you in Zurich right now? I'm in Zurich right now, yes. How's the, how's the situation there? Um, well, in terms of snow, we've got a lot of snow and had a lot of fun <laughs> doing winter sports, so that's fine. Uh, in terms of COVID, not, well, not so great, but I guess we can still go outside and play in the snow in the mountains, so we're happy. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, having the outdoor, yeah, is wonderful. Cool, maybe uh, let's start now. So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Control Meets Learning Seminar. So today we are delighted to have Professor Florent Doffler from ETH Zurich. So Professor Florent Doffler is an associate professor in the Automatic Control Lab at ETH and associate head of the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering. He received his PhD degree in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2013. And from 2013 to 2014, he was an assistant professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. His primary research interests are centered around control, optimization, and system theory with applications in network systems, especially in the electric power systems. He has received an impressive list of awards, including the Distinguished Young Research Awards by IFAC and EUCA in 2020, the Manfred Soma Medal and the European Control Award. Also, his students were winners of finalists for many Best Student Paper Awards, including the ECC, ACC, and CDC, or, and the Power System General Meeting and finalist, and many more. So, that's a very impressive yeah, like achievement. So today we will talk about data-enabled predictive control. So Florin, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction and thank you for organizing the seminar series. Um, I've myself watched a few of the previous lectures, so I really enjoyed this and I'm happy to contribute here. Let me start off acknowledging my collaborators that you can see here on the slide. Um, first and foremost, my student, uh, Jeremy Colson, and postdocs Lin Bin, Paul, as well as senior collaborators John DeGueros and Ivan Markovsky, and the entire team at the Automatic Control Lab that works on these uh, problems around data enabled predictive control. Okay, so um, I, I realize that this is an expert audience, so I only have one motivational slide for you, um, which you're probably all familiar with. So, the classical way of decision making is based on a model. That is, you would start off from raw data that you collect, maybe in open loop, maybe in closed loop. You perform system identification to get a parametric model plus an uncertainty estimate, and then you feed this into a robust control algorithm. Now, an ever more recent uh, trend, ever growing trend in computer science and various applications of control is data driven control entirely bypassing models. And here the canonical setup is sort of if a black box system, you have no mechanistic understanding of the first system. You connect, uh, collect input and output data and use this to tune some sort of direct data-driven control algorithm. And um, you wonder why. Why should anybody do this, right? Why, why should you give up on, you know, by now almost five centuries of physical modeling and multiple decades of model-based algorithms for control optimization, signal processing, and so on? Why? I mean, I get that it's fancy and, you know, urgent and contemporary, but is there any real solid reason why you should do this? And I've been struggling with this question myself for quite a while, and here's a few reasons I convince myself when this makes sense. Um, namely, data-driven control is truly a viable alternative whenever uh, models are too complex to be useful. An example is, for instance, fluid dynamics, or more engineering example is wind farms. So you have multiple wind turbines that are interconnected, not only electrically interconnected, but also they have fluid dynamic interactions um, through their wakes. And even if it's a full-blown physical model for that system, that model will not be very useful for the purpose of control design. 
in other applications, uh, first principle models are not conceivable. For instance, whenever you have human in the loop or perception type problems. And from the practitioner side, they typically complain that modeling and system ID is just very cumbersome and they prefer end to end solution. For instance, when I talk to my colleagues in robotics drives or electronics, they prefer, you know, off the shelf reinforcement learning over the entire model based uh, processing pipeline. And the central promise that this uh, data driven control has a very catchy one is that it's easier to learn a control policy from data rather than learning a model. Why should you go for this two-step approach if at the end the model only serves an auxiliary purpose to design your controllers, right? Which is a very catchy promise. And I've been wondering, you know, where, you know, despite being this a catchy phrase, does that make any sense in my world? And I found that, yes, we've been playing this trick all along in control, namely PID control is essentially a strategy like that, right? You, um, um, you collect input output data based on which you tune three control games and you can do this very well. In fact, PID control has been fully automated. Okay. Um, not sure if you can see my next slide. Uh, slightly hanging. Ah, oh, okay. So let's abstract the problem set up slightly. Um, namely, let's um, only look at indirect and direct data driven control, which um, is sort of a classification of the entire literature on this entire data driven approach. The indirect model-based approach as follows. You want to minimize a control cost that depends on your input and a state of the model, so some hidden latent variable. And this input and the state satisfy a model like ABCD state space equation. Typically, you have to estimate the states from inputs and outputs as well as your model, right? So there's an inner estimation problem. And finally, where do you get the model from? Um, the model you get from, sorry, I see my slides a little bit hanging here. Let me quickly switch to another PDF viewer because that's not working very well. Let me use this one instead. Okay, much better. Okay, and the model itself is identified from data, namely you collect data offline. So data is um, written here of the subscript D standing for data, UD and YD. And so you can see the standard algorithmic pipeline to control is a multi-level optimization problem. The outermost level is find the best controller. Um, the next inner level is you need to estimate the hidden state of the model used for control design. So that's the estimation problem. The innermost problem is you need to identify a model which is useful for both estimation and control. So this is a nested uh, tri-level optimization problem. Um, and clearly we have some separation principle and certain equivalents for the estimation and control problem. So we know we can solve the outer and the middle problem separately under some assumptions like in the LQG case, but in generally there's no separation whatsoever for the identification and the control problems. Okay, which motivates uh, an entire line of lit literature called identification for control, which has been now seen multiple decades of quite successful research. Uh, let's abstract the other approach, the direct data drift control. Here, the formulation is much more lean. You just ask to minimize the control cost depending on your uh, inputs and outputs, and you ask the inputs and outputs to be consistent with the data that you've seen. And at this level of abstraction, compared to direct and indirect approaches, you can very nicely see the trade-offs immediately, namely the indirect approach is very modular. Every step is uh, convex and tractable. Whereas the lower direct approach is end-to-end uh, -end formulation, uh, could be possibly optimal, right? But good luck finding a tractable formulation. So this end-to-end -end approach may improve on the multi-level approach because you don't have any intermediate levels, but it's unclear how to find a tractable representation. Of course, any sensible person would solve all of these problems either in a min-max fashion or using some expected value formulation to account for uncertainty. Good. What I'd like to pursue today is a direct approach, and I'll motivate this um, using some rather old research coming from dictionary learning plus NPC. Namely, the, the first step is that you learn a dictionary of trajectories. People in robotics have done this for decades. They would call them motion primitives. So you have a robot, you know how to lift the arm, how to turn the arm, and based on these motions, you can combine um, any other trajectory. Um, you can also just call the basis functions to learn the basis of the behavior of your system and then learn how to combine these basis functions. And the second step is just you apply model predictive control 
and say, find the best trajectory compatible with your dictionary. So just say, take a linear span of the dictionary to synthesize your trajectories. There's a lot of theory about this, for instance, going by the name of Koopman operators or on the dual side, uh, Liouville operators. But in practice, there are rather hackish approaches like dynamic mode decomposition or just four propagating particles. So there's a huge, huge theory practice gap in these methods, right? And this theory practice gap is not even resolved for linear systems. I'd like to take an even more simple approach and go back to basics, namely to linear single input, single output system and to the impulse response, which is a particular case of this dictionary learning actually. Namely, if you have a black box system, but you know it's a deterministic system, it's linear time invariant finite dimensional, you know the initial condition is zero, there are no disturbances, and you feed an impulse at time zero and you record the output, then this output is actually all that you need, right? Because based on the convolution formula, you can now predict any future output based on any future input just by the inner product of this recorded data and the input, right? This is what we all teach in bachelor course as the convolution formula, but just the vector product of this data that you recorded and the input to be designed, right? And you can think about this as a linear constraint for your you know, optimal control problem. And people figured this out already in the 70s uh, in industry in Shell, they called this dynamic matrix control. Uh, essentially it was predictive control based on raw data and it was the precursor to what nowadays is called MPC. When I talked to people that were in this business, they told me, you know, it never really took off, it never worked for multiple reasons. First of all, the impulse response is infinite dimensional. You typically don't have zero initial conditions. You always have disturbances, you have noise. Um, you don't have LTI systems, you know, essentially, it, you know, this clean case never happens in reality. Uh, what I'd like to do today is sort of follow up on this general line of ideas, but can I do this with arbitrary data? Can I do this with finite data? Um, can I do this in a stochastic setting for nonlinear systems? And how does this sort of dictionary learning uh, connect back to system identification and model-based control? So this is the question I'm after in this talk today. In terms of contents, here's what I'll talk about. I'll give you a little bit of insight into behavioral system theory and how this can be used to establish a non-parametric data-driven system theory. So how can you do system theory without models? Then I'll present you our algorithm, Data Enabled Predictive Control, or the acronym is DeepC that we coined in a moment of weakness. Um, I'll show you how this relates to system identification at the very end of the talk. This is a very recent work. And I'll pepper the entire talk with different applications from um, robotics and power systems. Let me give you a little bit of a teaser to show you what these methods can do for you that I'll present to you. So here's a very, very complicated control problem from power systems. Namely, each of these circles here is a synchronous generator. They're interconnected through some uh, large scale sparse transmission network. These are all AC lines that you see here, high voltage AC lines. And there's also this line, which is a special one, that's a high voltage DC line. And you have power converters at both ends of the line converted in DC and AC. What you often observe in these large and sparse networks are oscillations of power between different generators. So since the upper area may swing against the lower area, if you measure the power flow on the line, you will see these types of oscillations. Now the control problem is the following. You'd like to take measurements of these fluctuations of power across the lines. You feed these to two decentralized controller, one at each power converter, and with this decentralized control mechanisms, you want to essentially dampen these oscillations. Now, why is this control problem complicated? Well, the system is very large scale. It's about 208 states, uh, but you only have eight measurements. It's highly nonlinear. Uh, everything is stochastic, process noise, measurement noise. It's stiff, all time scales are involved. You have very tight input constraints. That is, you don't want to fry the switches of your converters, right? So you want to have a tight control on all variables, particularly the currents. And you want to have two decentralized controllers, okay? So rather tough control specifications, and you want to damp these oscillations. So if you're in power system and you've been working on this type of problem, it will probably take you quite a while to come up with any reasonable, well-working controller for this problem. And there would be no theoretic certificates whatsoever. You would just tune it by simulation and then hope it works. That's the, all you can do for these type of problems. What I'd like to do today is try to solve this problem without having any model at our disposal, which is quite reasonable within this application. Reason being the grid has many owners. The models are proprietary. 
And the operation is always in flux anyway. So even if you had a model, it would change all the time. Okay. So the method I'll present to you in the following slides will pull off the following. It will record these measurements, these oscillations here for about 10 seconds. And then we turn on our control algorithm and eventually dampen these oscillations quite nicely. Subject to all of these issues up here, right? Subject to nonlinearity, uh, partial observations, stochasticity, and so on. Um, which is quite surprising. And what I claim is this is not just a lucky shot. The method that we have actually you know, works reliably. That is not just for this particular simulation, but for all simulations. It can be efficiently implemented. That is, I can get it down to a microcontroller. And it's certifiable. That is, I can actually prove that it works, even for this complicated system. So the goal is eventually to completely automate myself, you know, my job as a control engineer, uh, replace myself by an algorithm. Um, we don't get all the way there, but I think we carve out a promising approach that will, you know, come up with, you know, certified, highly efficient and reliable methods. Good. Um, now you should ask yourself, well, okay, let's do a reality check. It's just magic or hoax because, you know, no other, no other data-driven control method, reinforcement learning whatsoever will be able to pull this off for such a complicated system. So, and even if, you know, nobody would implement this either, right? So nobody would implement a data-driven control method on the world's most expensive, most complex engineered system. Nobody would do this using the world's biggest actuators, HVDC links, which are the size of gigawatt, right? So this is huge actuation power. And subject to all the issues such as real-time computation, safety, stability, and so on. Nobody, right? Um, so when we put our papers in the archive, we got contacted by um, R&D groups, by ABB and Hitachi, who are actually really working on these problems and design these controls in the wild. And they told us, yes, this is a very cool method. Um, this seems to be really what we need in practice. Can you send us our code and we'll try it out? Okay. So we packaged our black box type code in a, in a C function. We sent them over it. They implemented the code on their own simulators, which are written in a completely different language on different case states with thousands of states. And it turns out it works, right? A few days after sending, after sending our code, they sent us back this plot that was like, wow, hey, it really works. Completely black box on a completely different setup, different system, different software which you shouldn't expect, but um, we were quite excited about this. So uh, why do I tell this to you? Just to motivate it, at least somebody believes that this uh, method entitled Deep Sea is actually useful also in practice, okay? not just theory. Good, I think now I owe you a little bit of an explanation what is below the hood here, okay? So one of the working horses um, below our algorithm is behavioral system theory. Behavioral system theory is a very abstract branch of system theory, um, you know, envisioned by Jan Willems. And it defines a dynamic system just as a set. Okay, namely the behavior is just a set of all trajectories that the system can express. In particular, a dynamic system in discrete times of three tuple, um, where set um, greater zero is a set of integers, that's a discrete time axis. W is a signal space, so it's a set of inputs and outputs if you want to. And the behavior is just a subset of all possible time series, a subset of W to the power of the integers, just a set of trajectories. So a very abstract set theoretic way of thinking about a dynamic system, but actually quite useful in practice, as we will see. We don't need the full power. Let's specify a little bit. So what we need are linear systems, namely a system is linear if that signal space is a vector space and the behavior is a subspace of the space of all time series. Okay, so the trajectories from a subspace. And it's time invariant, provided that the behavior is invariant under a shift operator. So sigma takes wt to wt plus one, and the behavior is just uh, invariant on shift. So in short, uh, LTI system is just a shift invariant subspace of your trajectory space. For instance, this here, what you see is an LTI system. Okay, partition your signals into inputs and outputs, and in the set of all input output time series, a subspace is an LTI system. And this very abstract way of thinking is very compatible to how machine learning people will think about dynamic systems. They typically would not consider the notion of time separately or causality. They would just take the data as it is and look for some low dimensional features in the data set, such as the subspace. Okay? So it's very much compatible with that line of thinking. So what you should remember here is that an LTI system is a shift invariant subspace of the trajectory space. Good. The second workhorse are matrix time series. 
which are really the foundation of subspace system modification methods as well as signal recovery algorithms. Okay, in particular, think about uh, black box LTR system. You put an input, you collect an output, and you record all the data. Okay, for instance, if the system is LTR, you know that black box would admit what is called an ARX representation, autoregressive representation of exogenous inputs, or more plainly said, a constant coefficient difference equation. To take u at time t with some coefficient b0, u at time t plus 1 with some coefficient b1, the same for the y's, and the sum of all of these should be 0. Okay, um, Also called LTI model. Right? Um, behavioral system people call such a representation a kernel representation. Now, why is that? So if you don't have a model at your disposal of this form, a time series model, you could just collect your, your data, your experiments, and put them in a matrix, right? So for instance, you collect a trajectory matrix where the first column is the first experiment, the second column is the second experiment, and so on, okay? So the first entry is the first input, uh, the input uh, at time one of the first experiment, the output at time one from the first experiment, and you go on in time the second input of the first experiment, the second output of the first experiment, and so on. So you put in here your time series in every column up to, say, some length t. So you have a bunch of length t time series, right? And notice that if you take this trajectory matrix and were to multiply it from the left with this vector of coefficients of the constant coefficient difference equation, this vector would live in the null space of that matrix. OK, that's why this is called a kernel representation. And this here will be the corresponding image representation. Uh, so you can very nicely go from the model to something on the data. And then the question is, can you go backwards? Does this arrow go both ways? So you can go from the data again to a model. And these representations are somehow equivalent. And that's true under some assumptions. Okay? And these assumptions nowadays became known as a result called the fundamental lemma, which was conceived by uh, Jan Willems and co-workers in 2005. When I first heard the name, I thought, oh, that's a little bit pretentious, right? To call a result, a result the fundamental lemma. But once you understand it, you really truly believe it is fundamental. Okay, so that was by Willems 2005. And we recently sort of cleaned up the result and made it necessary and sufficient. Uh, myself together with um, Ivan Markovsky. So that was the following. You have a black box, LTI, and you collect input output data. Okay, so given to you is some data of inputs and outputs. Also, for the black box, you need some notion of complexity, namely define the LTI system um, by its order n. So that's one notion of complexity, and the lag L, that is how many time shifts do you need. Of course, in the SISO case, you're the same. In the MIMO case, this may be different. And then you take this behavioral perspective, that is, you look at the set of all trajectories. So the set of all trajectories up to length t, the set of all t length time series the system can produce. Normally, we'll take a parametric model to specify this. So you said that's a set of all u in Rm, y in Rp, and total there's t of them, such that there exists an x a state, and everything satisfies an ABCD state space model. That's the normal way we would parameterize such a set. It turns out you can alternatively parameterize the set just by trajectories. Namely, this set is equivalent just to putting all your trajectories in this trajectory matrix and take the range of that matrix, the column span. And that equivalently spans the set of all trajectories, the behavior of the system. Now notice, this, this is a parametric model. And this, you just take raw data, completely you know, model-free, non-parametric. I mean, it's up to you to call the model or not, but it spans the same set of trajectories. And now everything you can do with the model, you can equivalently do just working with raw data. Now that result is almost too good to be true. Um, there probably must be an assumption, right? And the assumption is the following. Uh, this equivalence of the parametric model and just the trajectory matrix holds true if and only if this trajectory matrix has a certain rank condition. And it must have rank um, m, which is the number of inputs, times t, which is the length of a time series, plus n, which is the order of the state space model, for all t, which are longer than the length of the system. Okay, And that's the, the fundamental lemma. So here's again the result, the set of all trajectories that you can construct with an LTI system is equivalent just to the column span of this trajectory matrix. Or in words, all trajectories you ever want to construct, you can construct from finitely many previous trajectories. Now, if you don't remember anything about this talk, maybe just remember that one result, which is really the, the basis for a lot of things, because now you can do an entire non-parametric system control theory. <clears throat> 
Good. So you can also use other uh, matrix data structures. You don't have to use this trajectory format. You can go to Hankel matrices, page matrices, and so on. Uh, what's the novelty? Um, to some extent, you know, people in robotics have always played with the idea, let's just combine basis function, motion primitives, uh, and fluids that work with dynamic mode decomposition, uh, or more broadly, dictionary learning methods. Um, subspace system identification relies on that. They all more or less rely on this equivalence being true. And I guess now it's proven, right? So that's why Williams call it the fundamental lemma. It's really the underpinning of all of you know methods that are based on time series. Um, I don't want to take credit for this result. We're really standing here on the shoulders of giants, namely uh, Jan Willems, Paul Rapisade, Ivan Markovsky, and Bart Demore, who conceived this result in 2004. Um, our, their result was only sufficient. We sort of removed a whole bunch of assumptions, such as particular matrix structures, persistive excitation, and controllability, to really come up with equivalence only based on the rank condition. And now you can build an entire non parametric data driven control theory based on such a result. Um, and a lot of people do this, okay? So you can do control from matrix time series data. And there are many groups doing this. Um, on our side, we go more the implicit and stochastic route together with Ian Markovsky. The team in Groningen goes more the explicit deterministic control route. There's many other people that jumped on this topic. There's by now about one archive paper a week by many groups like Algeva or Matni Papas and so on. And it's also related to very classic literature in subspace predictive control by the Baltimore group from a while ago. But to be honest, we all are really just writing the dramatic corollaries of this result conceived by Ambulance. Okay, so this is sort of my literature review. Now let me tell you how we use this fundamental lemma. Namely, let me tell you how to use it for prediction estimation, which dates back to Markovsky and Rapisada. The problem is the following. Um, you would like to predict the future, okay? You're given a few, you want to predict the future output. Uh, every Y is an RP. In total, there's T future of them. That's the length of time series. And what you have at your disposal is an input signal, right? If you want to essentially for predict, you need an input. You also need an initial condition, right? And to construct the initial condition, what you're given is the immediate past trajectory. That is all time samples from minus T and E, minus T, minus one, and so on, until minus one and zero. So the immediate past, that allows you to estimate some hidden initial condition of a hidden state space model. And you're given past data that you collected offline to form this trajectory matrix. Good. And now you just apply the fundamental, fundamental lemma. Every trajectory lives an image of this trajectory matrix. In particular, your trajectory of the immediate past, u in e, y in e, and trajectory of the future, future input, future output have to live in the image of this matrix. And this matrix, the subscript indicates them of rows and total as T in e plus T future. The T in e is for these uh, indices for the estimation and the T future is for these, uh, for the prediction. And so everything must lie in the image of this matrix. So there's a vector G such that this equality holds true. So what you do, you just take all your data that you collect offline, you put it in this trajectory matrix, you partition it. So there's here inputs, outputs, inputs, outputs corresponding to the right-hand side. And then you just compute the vector G and the vector Y from this equation. That's as easy as you can do prediction estimation. And will this work? Yes, I guess it gives you the correct answer and the correct output, um, provided that an observability condition holds, namely your initial trajectory, your T in E, must be longer than the lag of the system. So you can recover a unique initial condition of some hidden underlying state space model. Okay, so just by playing with this fundamental lemma, you can do prediction estimation. Any trajectory has to live in the trajectory matrix. And now you can do everything you need to do for control, right? In particular, let's go to a control method called output model predictive control, or MPC shortly. The idea is the following. What you have is a model ABCD, okay, this here, that you use um, for predicting forward. So you just iterate this model forward in time from time equal uh, one to some future time to future, and you optimize over u, x, and y to solve a tracking problem. Namely, the output of y should track a reference, and you want to minimize the control effort and maybe satisfy constraints on the way. Notice that in this sort of formulation, you need to know the, the state from somewhere. So you need to know the initial condition of the state, typically you don't measure the state. One way to construct the initial condition is just to iterate this model again backwards in time, 
So notice here the time index just run backwards, okay? And you do the estimation. Of course, if you now have noisy measurements, you wouldn't solve these constraints with equality, but you would do some sort of least square estimation a la Kalman filtering. There's many variations of that. And then you solve this optimization problem, you get new measurements and keep on repeating it in closed loop. Now, this is sort of the computational approach to control, um, maybe not the most scientifically elegant, but you know, boy, it works. It works really well. Namely, if your system is deterministic and LTI, and you have an exact model of the plant, then NPC is really the gold standard of control. You can't beat it, right? So is it. Uh, of course, the crux is, um, well, deterministic LTI, I'll get to that later, and having an exact model, right? So what if you don't have a model? Let's focus on this part first and later fix the deterministic LTI. When you don't have a model, you can just use the fundamental lemma. Because instead of using the model for prediction estimation, you just replace the model by saying, Every trajectory has to live in the image of the trajectory matrix, in particular the immediate past and the future, and you just now optimize over u, y, and the vector g that collects the columns of this matrix. So now you have a completely non-parametric data-driven uh, MPC type formulation, which we call the deep C. Okay. And the way you should read this optimization problem, so this u, e, and y, e, are your reason most measurements that you collect online, right? And the elements of this trajectory matrix, um, you collect offline from past data. Okay, I dropped now the index of the number of rows, the teeny plus the future, to make it more readable. But just think about it, this matrix must have sufficiently many rows to be compatible with the right-hand side. So these entries are collected offline, but of course you could not think about adapting all of this online and go to direct adaptive control. Does this uh, work um, where for LTI systems in the clean case, you can prove nice consistency results, namely consider these two optimization problems of the deep C and the MPC. If your data is sufficiently rich, that is if the, the rank condition holds, then the feasible sets of these two optimization problems coincide. The dramatic corollary being that the closed loop behaviors under both problems coincide. Okay, um, so everything carries over. Um, so you can look at a case study here. We put it all on a linearized quadcopter case study. So we have a quadcopter, we linearize it, we put it ourselves in the LTI framework. And then we say, please track a figure eight. And of course it works. I mean, uh, we proved it. So there's no need to look in this. And particularly you can make a case that now everything you know about LTI system, MPC for LTI systems, you can carry over. Um, for instance, um, the stability certificates, you know, for MPC, carry over for the deep sea and there's some nice work from the group in Stuttgart doing that, that I recommend reading. Um, but what I'm interested in really is what when you go beyond the LTI systems, okay? What when you have stochasticity, what when you have non-linearity, corrupt data, missing data, all these things. And normally we just play on certain equivalents that is, you know, just don't care, try it out. But that does not work, uh, certainly not in theory and also in practice, okay? Put it on that quadcopter, put in some measurement noise, take the nonlinear model, no, the, the clean approach will not work. So you need to robustify yourself somehow. Okay, and that's the next line of thinking. So how do we deal with uh, the case when we don't have an LTI system, right? So let's first wonder how do we deal with noisy real-time measurements? That is this y e which is our reason most measurement here, if that is noisy. The way you normally deal with noisy measurement is, well, Kalman filtering, so least square estimation. In the MPC context, you would do it as follows. You would just add a slack variable, sigma any, and you penalize the slack, okay? With some coefficient lambda y. So essentially that's a receding horizon least square filter. And you can formally show that this is an exact penalty that is this equation is slack, only if, um, I guess it's infeasible if you make lambda y sufficiently large. Let's test it out on our quadcopter example. Let's run some sensitivity analysis, um, some randomized simulations. And we see as we increase this estimations um, coefficient here, the, the realized cost will go down. That is, you know, this works really wonderfully. And also the number of constraint violations in closed loop will go down, meaning this sort of um, adding a slack for the measurement and penalizing the slack. So some receding horizon filtering works wonderfully. Okay, that's a great trick. I guess the standard trick in MPC how to deal with um, noisy measurements. The more interesting case is the following. You know, your data that you collected offline is also corrupted by noise, right? 
And this is a hard one because that's what in control we call multiplicative noise or in statistics, you would call it the error and variable setting, which is a tough one to deal with, right? So we tried various ways how we can go around this. Um, let me not tell you what did not work. Let me tell you what worked. In the end, what worked well was adding L1 penalty on G. That is, you know, you don't just solve for like the G here, but you solve for the one with the least one norm with some regularizing coefficient on the G. So you add an L1 regularization. I'll give you the formal theory for that later on. Let me now just provide the intuition. The intuition is every column of this matrix is a trajectory. Okay, and you now combine trajectories you collect offline to form your new optimal trajectory, all right? Um, essentially what the one norm does, it promotes a sparse solution. You combine very few trajectories, meaning you combine some sort of low order basis. So you restrict the complexity of everything you want to predict. Um, let's do some sensitivity analysis. Again, when we introduce this regularization and um, the cost will nicely go down, okay? A number of constraint relations will nicely go down. Of course, you make the regularization too large, the cost will go up again, right? Because essentially you, you solve for G is equal to zero at some point. So it works wonderfully. Uh, what about nonlinear systems? Okay. Um, let's be pragmatic and let's say every system is linear. Actually, it's a theorem, right? It's without loss of generality. There's various tricks. What's going by the name of Kalaman linearization, Voltaire Fleece series, Koopman operator, and so on, that allow you to lift a nonlinear vector field under some assumption, like analyticity or so to a large or sometimes infinite dimensional linear system, sometimes also bilinear inputs. Um, more plainly speaking, I don't have to convince you that on a finite horizon, you can approximate um, any sort of nonlinear dynamics with a LTI system of sufficiently high order. Okay, so let's be bold, just move on. Let's collect more data. And let's say the regularization should single out any sort of relevant features from the data or the basis function. Okay, now does that work? Okay, so, so here's a case study. Okay, so we have the deep sea, we add a slack, we add a regularizer, okay? And we just add more columns and then it would nicely work out even in the full blown nonlinear case, right? And at this point you should ask yourself, you know, all right, now you applied a bunch of tricks uh, without giving a little of justification. Is this really solid? Is this a fluke, right? So you add a slack variable for the estimation, you add some regularization to deal with nonlinearity more data and stochasticity, so does this work? Um, let's put it in an experiment. Let, I guess I have to load the video offline because that viewer does not support the video. Let me show you the video offline. Um, I think it's, it's that one. No, this one. So here we have the quadcopter. We fly it now by hand. So flying it by hand means we collect the data for the trajectory matrix. And now it has the trajectory matrix and now it can do anything it wants, particularly say, let's track a figure eight. And it works wonderfully, right? And it works despite measurement noise, despite latencies, despite pack drops, despite nonlinearities and all these things. So it works really, really well, actually much better than you would expect it to work, okay? So all these tricks somehow add up to something really useful. Um, is it just, again, a lucky case study? Uh, no, it turns out it works always like this, right? So we put it on every single hardware experiment we found in our lab. So in the energy world, grid connected power converters, drives, this power system example from before, an energy hub, on the robotics, we put it on the pendulum swing up in the quadcopter, and it always works really well, right? And there was at no point in the model involved. It's nice to really ask yourself, you know, that there's some, probably something more to it than a fluke. Let's put some theory behind all of this. Okay. And the theory why it works so well, despite nonlinearity and stochasticity, um, we found different theoretic approaches to explain it. So let me provide you my favorite one, which is based on distributional robustness. And it goes as follows. Let's slightly abstract the problem. So we're solving for an optimization problem is we want to minimize our control cost, which depends on the decision variable X inside some feasible set, and which is subject to samples. This Xi hat denotes measured data. Let me slightly rewrite this problem. Namely, let me write this an expected value problem. Let me take the expected value over the empirical distribution. That is at every sample that I've seen, I put a delta. And I can write that as an expected value problem with respect to the empirical distribution. 
which now makes it look more complicated, but it's the same after all. Um, but it tells you sort of where the problem relies when you want to implement this. I mean, this is called the sample average problem. And if you solve that problem and you apply the solution on the real problem, you will suffer a loss, an out of sample loss, right? Reason being the optimal solution that you solve here, if you apply in a real problem, you, you have a different probability distribution, right? Because the, the real world will not so follow the sample distribution, right? There will be some stochastic process behind that drives your system governed by some distribution P, uh, which is not the P hat sample distribution. So that tells you already what you have to do. You need to robustify yourself against not knowing the real stochastic process of the system. So what you do is a distribution and robust formulation, essentially a min-max approach where the maximum is over all stochastic processes, linear, non-linear, Gaussian, non-Gaussian, whatever you want, that could have generated the data. Okay. More formally, you formulate as follows. Uh, you have an inf soup problem of some expected value. The expectation with respect to some probability distribution Q and you maximize over Q. In particular, look for all Q which are near your sample distribution more precisely in an epsilon ball around your sample distribution, p hat. And the way you choose that ball is according to the Wasserstein metric. So what is that one? Uh, quick crash course. So you have two probability distributions, an empirical one and the real one. So you see your samples as real distribution. You want to figure out the distance between them. So you construct a joint distribution pi, which has the right marginals once you project on the axis. And then you form the difference of xi minus xi hat, so elements of each axis and integrate over d pi, meaning you construct the expected distance, the expected amount of earth you have to shovel to get from one distribution to the other. But there are many such distributions pi, and so you take the one that would give you the smallest integral. Okay, and that's the Wasserstein metric. And this is how you construct the ball. All right, I mean, looks all good and nice. I just copied here. So you solve it, you have now a min-max problem, but that looks horribly complicated, right? It's doubly semi-infinite. You have here an optimization over distributions and the Wasserstein ball itself is formulated as in some infinite problems. So good luck solving that. It turns out you can actually solve it in closed form, namely under minor technical conditions, essentially Lipschitz continuity of cost and find out mean of the probability distribution involved. You can show that this quite horrible double semi infinite in soup problem is equivalent to the problem you started with, namely the sample average problem, okay, plus a regularization. And what you regularize with, if you choose here some p norm to construct the distance, you take here the dual norm. You take here the infinite norm, then you take here the one norm. And the regularization constant is related to the Lipschitz constant of the cost times epsilon, where epsilon is your desired robustness radius, okay. which distribution do you want to consider. In our case, the corollary is really that if you L1 regularize the deep C problem, you get L infinity robustness in the space of trajectories. Um, and that's really why it works. That's why it works now for <clears throat> all nearby systems in this Wasserstein metric, which includes nonlinear stochastic and whatsoever. And explains these nice plots that you're seeing when you increase the regularizer, what you really do, you increase the robustness radius. This initially not robust to anything. You increase the regularizer, you become robust. And at some point, you become robust to everything. It's not useful anymore. Okay. Um, so this is how I can explain this to yourself. Okay. Um, some further ingredients that I'll just quickly glance over uh, because of time. Um, of course, when you have more data, what you do, you can do some data compression. So you can just average all your trajectory matrices you construct offline. So you just take the average of all of your uh, samples that you have. It turns out as you keep on averaging, you can shrink your uncertainty ball to zero. So epsilon will decrease as one over n with some exponent, which depends on the dimension of your random variable. So it doesn't scale gracefully, but you know, asymptotically, you can show a measure concentration result. Everything will go to zero as you get more samples. Um, the reality is, you know, this is sort of a worst case rate. In reality, just taking uh, one uh, data sample or taking 10 data samples and averaging gets you already much better in terms of now we can get to almost half the uncertainty radius there. You can also include uh, recursive Kalman filtering inside the problem to also take care of all the very past distant uh, measurements. Hey, you want the common filtering, don't you need a state variable here? In terms of yes, you need. Uh, the state is sort of the parametric solution of the optimization problem, the G star. Okay, if you're interested, look at the paper by Daniele Alpago. You can apply all the formulas and also to constraints. So you can formulate probabilistic constraints. 
in this case, what we call the CVAR, conditional value at risk constraint. I uh, will not explain details of what it is, but it can also go for uh, worst case constraint in the sense of distribution robustness and resolve all of this in closed form to get some sort of robust uh, probabilistic constraints. And putting this all together, you see it works quite nicely, right? So we have our quadcopter, which is uh, noisy and uh, nonlinear, and we can very nicely track trajectories subject to constraints by means of this regularization, by means of the matrix predictor, by averaging past data, by including the CVAR constraints and an estimation slack. So the, the consequence of this deep C works really well, actually much better than it should, in my opinion. So what's the catch, right? You cannot violate the no free lunch theorem, so there must be a catch. And the main catch is sort of these optimization problems become large. Not prohibitively large, we can still solve it, say, in the power electronics case on a microcontroller um, in real time, um, but certainly they become large which reveals a feature of models, namely that they are compressed, denoised, and tidied up representations of raw data. And that brings me to the last point of this presentation. Now you wonder, okay, and so how does all of this compare to models, right? Because that's where we started from. Um, surprise, across all case studies, actually, that we looked at, the deep sea consistently beats the models. That is, if you look at the realized control cost, then you will always be certainly equivalence control based on susmultiplication where you identify an equivalent LTI model. Uh, this deserves a closer look. And that's the last thing I'd like to discuss in this presentation. So how does deep C relate to sequential system ID and control? So let's go back to the very beginning where I told you about the problem abstraction that you can classify all data-driven control like groups in indirect and direct. So the indirect, as you now understand, is sort of the identification-based data-driven control. I skip the estimation. I just say minimize control costs depending on inputs and outputs that satisfy some sort of parametric model. And the parametric model you get from, as an in-optimization problem, you get from data. So you minimize an identification cost depending on the data, subject to the model being within a certain complexity class. So you can choose a hypothesis class, say LTI, a certain state order N, and a lag L. So that's the ID problem, the inner problem. And you can already see clearly some pros and cons at this level of abstraction. Namely, what is identification? Identification can really be thought of as projecting the data on the set of models that you choose. In this case, LTI with certain complexity parameters NL that you have to choose. This projection is sort of a projection instead of deterministic models, meaning it removes the noise, right? So it leads to what identification people call a lower variance error. I mean, here, by projecting on the LTI models, the mystic, you remove variance. But you may suffer what is called a bias error. That is, if your real model that has a real system that has generated data is not within your hypothesis class, which is this one, LTI and L, then you may suffer a loss, right? So there's the variance and the bias error. Now, what about the direct approach? As you've now learned, you need to regularize the direct approach. It comes in the form, minimize the control cost depending on inputs and outputs, plus a regularization. And everything has to be compatible with data. Okay, and now at this level of abstraction, you see that the regularization robustifies your problem, namely choosing the regularizer makes it all work. Um, and at no point you have a projection instead of LTI system, right? There's no projection any hypothesis class of models. Meaning among others, there's no denoising, right? But also there's no bias error that you encounter. So that's quite interesting. So that leads me now to two hypotheses that I'd like to put out there and confirm in the next slide. Namely, identification wins in a stochastic case. Reason being by projecting on set of deterministic LTI models, you remove variance, you remove noise. But if you have the wrong model class, so if your real system is not linear, then this projection will lead you to bias. It is the direct approach, deep C should win in the nonlinear case. Okay, we'll check that hypothesis on the next slide. And the second hypothesis is the following. The real difference between these two problems is here do identification, here do regularization. And you wonder, well, is this regularization somehow connected to identification or not? Okay, is there some theory that allows you to link the two? And this is the second hypothesis I want to answer in the remaining slides. So the first hypothesis, when does uh, ID win, when does deep C win? Um, so let's first look at the stochastic LTI case. 
So we have fifth order LTI system. We do LQR uh, control, in this case, uh, feed forward control. We collect the data from the system with Gaussian noise. We look at different signal to noise ratios and we use an L1 regularized deep C and the system identification via enforced the subspace algorithm. And for both methods, we traditionally chose all the hyperparameters. What do the simulations look like? If you do 100 rollouts for each noise to signal ratio, it's as follows. On this axis, you see how noisy the data is. So here's the deterministic, here's stochastic. On this axis, you see the realized control error once you apply the policy to the system. So if there's no noise, then both, model, both approaches work very well. But as you start increasing the noise, the red approach, which is the direct approach, direct data control, the deep sea, will perform less and less well. So it will be inferior, whereas this one has nearly constant performance, which we attribute to the fact that what identification does is projects on the nearest deterministic model, so it removes the noise, which confirms our hypothesis that ID wins in the stochastic case. Now, what about nonlinear setting? So, in nonlinear setting, we use a lot Cavaltera nonlinear vector field that with some control input. And now, to study the effect of nonlinearity, we construct an interpolated system, which is this one that is, we interpolate uh, between the linearized and nonlinear model. So, epsilon being one means we're looking at the linearized model, epsilon being zero, we look at the nonlinear model. And we have the same setup as on the previous case study. So again, on this plot, you see on the axis, the epsilon, meaning on the right, you have the linear case, on the left, you have the fully nonlinear case. And as you can see now, that the indirect the identification-based method works well for linear, but very poorly for nonlinear, whereas the direct data control method, as hypothesized, works almost equally well for nonlinear or linear, right? Which confirms the hypothesis that deep sevens in the nonlinear case when we suffer bias error. Good, how am I doing on time? Um, let me just use one more slide because I realize I'm at the end. Um, the last one is how does regularization uh, connect to system identification? Um, and let me just use that one slide to explain it. Namely, the, the bi-level problem is the following. So you have a minimizer control problem subject to a model where the model comes from the identification problem. Same problem you've seen before. As an example, have in mind, you look for a parametric ARX predictor where Y is related to U through a linear map K and K also depends on the past inputs and outputs. Okay, this is just an LTI system written as an ARX model here in vector form. And uh, the identification cost is sort of you have a least square fit, so you use past data to fit the K and the model class you choose by choosing essentially the rank of K. Namely, K also has to have rank N plus ML, where N is the state, M is the number of time, uh, and M is the input dimension, and L is how much you want to bring forward. Okay, so essentially some low rank least square fit that you have to solve in theory. Now let's relax the problem because low rank is hard, and let's drop this complex specification. So let's do convex relaxation, and we get to a simpler problem. This problem is still a bi-level problem. So let me lift it to a single level. That is, I just lift that constraint now to the objective. That is, I just add here the control cost plus some lambda times the identification cost. So that's an exact penalty method. And under some assumption, if lambda is sufficiently large, these two problems become equivalent. And relaxation, of course, making lambda not sufficiently large. And finally, if you write this entire model in terms of everything has been image of the data matrix, this can be again reformulated into just a regularization. Okay, this is not obvious, requires a few tricks. I refer to the paper, but this is an equivalent step. There's no more convex relaxation involved. For this particular representation, if you go through these steps of arguments, you really find that the convex relaxation of doing this sort of least square identification of an ARX predictor gives you just a regularizer which depends on the norm of G times the projection and null space of the trajectory matrix. And likewise, you can derive other regularizers like the one norm and so on by particular formulations of that problem. Long story short, the way you should think about direct data-driven control, it's a convex relaxation of the indirect approach. And let me just now conclude showing you how this extra term project null space of the directory matrix performs. Um, that's the red curve. So if you look at the realized control cost, this is really nice, especially compared to other regularizers, which is just norm-based. 
namely if you make the regularization coefficient sufficient large you get really awesome performance there's not this um, convex form as for the others meaning uh, now choosing hyperparameters becomes really really simple and i think I'll, I'll stop right here sorry for going slightly over time and let me know if you have any questions yeah, yes. So thanks so much, Florian, for this wonderful talk. I have a quick question and also there are a couple of questions in the chat box. So mm -hmm. my question is more about, so like when you collect this trajectory, do you have any requirement for how diversity they should be? Like maybe you collect this data from like in the power system because they are all under the normal operation condition. So will that satisfy the matrix rank constraint or do you have mm -hmm. any comment on the on how should you collect this trajectory like relates to the uh, mm -hmm. matrix rank conditions. As you said yourself, the only formal theory requirement is mm -hmm. that this matrix has a certain rank. Yeah. You know, um, and in case you have noisy observations, it will always have full rank. <laughs> in, in practice, the rank condition is irrelevant. Um, of course, if you have no noise, then you need to carefully sort of select your input, uh, for instance, the white noise will make sure that almost surely you have this rank condition. Um, but of course, you, what you're interested in is really the, the, the noisy case. Um, I don't have a good answer to your question. We're thinking about ourselves right now. Ideally, what we'd like to have is, of course, all these columns being somewhat orthogonal. Okay, so it, it goes back to the question of experiment design. How do you choose your experiments so to make this matrix more or less have orthogonal columns? I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but it's a definitely a good question for future work, especially if you want to do this all in real time and to carefully think about how do you excite the system, where do you explore, and so on. But this is, uh, I have no answer. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, and then we have a few questions on the, yeah, first one I think is more like a quick clarification. I guess in the video, like for the helicopter that is tracking the eight trajectory is not like stabilized, you, like you, you don't want to automatically stabilize it, right? Yes, correct. I mean, you would not apply such a method on an open loop unstable system. So we did to collect the data, we put in the U of T on top of our manual steering, we put a PID stabilizer on top of it. So the U of T was both sort of a random excitation, but also a PID stabilizing control signal. Yes. Got it. Yeah, and uh, Abnick uh, is asking the output in order to track a non-zero set need to have non-zero input to be applied to the system. However, the cost function doesn't consider the tracking error in the mm -hmm. input as considered uh, in the case of the output. So I see, yes, yes. Um, so I should say this cost function is only an example. You can take any convex cost function. In terms of the theory, what you need is a a Lipschitz cost function, meaning you probably don't want to take the squares, but the square root of everything. And what the question was essentially, if you want to take a track a reference R, then you don't want to use a zero control input as your optimum, but you want also have to a UR, a reference for the U. That's absolutely correct. Now the question is, if you have no model information whatsoever, where do you get the reference for the U from? But in, you know, there's no. A, this was just an example of cost function. You can take whatever you find useful. Cool. And Sayak is asking, like, uh, I'm wondering uh, whether the techniques that you are developing using the fundamental lemma have any underlying connection with the methodologies to perform optimal control with unknown model using adaptive dynamic programming like ADP, yeah, that use mm -hmm. Newton Clement type updates to iterate, uh, to iterate the learning of control gains from data. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a few comments. So first I should acknowledge I'm not familiar with this particular version of ADP that you're referring to, but I can make a comment about the more general connection to adaptive control. That is, you know, we collect all of this data offline, right? All of what I've done here, collected data offline, but this is just an exercise in terms of the real goal we would like to be, say a year from now, two years from now, is to push this all to online data collection. Meaning online, you would like to collect this, data, this trajectory matrix, and they need to, of course, know when to explore, where to explore, and these things. Um, so there's no connection as of right now to, to ADP or adaptive control, because it's really a sequential, essentially offline exploration, online exploitation. 
Cool, cool. And I see we we have uh, some. Yeah, I will just take the final two question here. Yeah. So, uh, so Yingying and Manish, do you want to just unmute yourself and direct, uh, like talk with Professor Doppler or? Hi. Um. Thank you for the talk. It's so wonderful talk. So I have two questions. First, for the nonlinear control, uh, mm -hmm. maybe just for the experiments, how do you select the length of the data trajectory? Because I know in the mm -hmm. for the linear case, you have some guidelines on how to select the length. But for the nonlinear case, uh, yes. how, how do you select it for the nonlinear case? And also, maybe theoretically, is there any guideline to select mm -hmm. the length? Sure, yes. Um, so as you said yourself, in the linear case, you have some guidelines, namely some stability theorems for MPC that tell you you need to cho choose the horizon sufficiently long, right? Or if you choose it too short, you may need some other tricks like a terminal cost and these things, which we don't do. We just choose a sufficiently long horizon. Now, how should you find this sufficiently long horizon? I guess that question, that's independent if you use a data-driven or model-based method. Um, there are some theoretic estimates, um, but these are essentially useless because they're not very tight. Uh, long story short, we experiment. We pick the longest horizon that we can still solve in real time. Okay, so we know what our microcontroller can do, and we predict the furthest forward we can as long as we can still solve the problem in real time. Uh, uh, but how about the uh, the length of the UD and the YD, the data? Um, the data? Yeah. Yes, this data has to be okay. Essentially, you have to match the dimensions of the left and right inside of this equation, meaning mm -hmm. that they, each experiment has to be as long as your initial estimation trajectory and your future prediction trajectory. Okay. I see. For the, for the initial estimation, you give yourself an estimate of what is the lag of the system, what you think, you give yourself a bound and pick it so long. Essentially, that's a complexity specification on the system. And for the future trajectory, we just pick whatever we can compute in real time within the sampling rate of the microcontroller. That's how we do it. Um, of course, what you see, I can maybe I can just show you a few plots for the power system example. Right. So the, the plots you get would somehow look like this. So you make your future horizon longer, and the cost will go down, and very nicely so. Right. Now, ideally make it as long as possible right but this is typically what you see the longer you make the future horizon the better the performance will be um, actually the same for the initial horizon you make the initial horizon longer performance will go down the reason being this initial horizon corresponds to some notion of hidden state dimension of the system that you learn uh, okay never you never learn a system but that's sort of what the algorithm uses and of course the more high dimensional your representation attacks the better you do so in short take them as long as possible but you should still be able to solve it in real time. That's the ultimate constraint. I think it makes sense. Thanks. I have another question. So sure. have you considered the process noises uh, mm -hmm. for the deep uh, uh, predictor control? Because I think you mentioned the measurement noises. So how about the process noise? Mm -hmm. And also when there are process noises, is there any guarantee for the state constraint satisfaction, like for the safety? So mm -hmm. is there any guarantee? Sure. So, so the nice thing about this distribution robustness formulation is that it's distribution free. Meaning, you know, you, you robustify yourself to any distribution that is nearby your samples. It's not just a distribution that could have come from a deterministic system plus measurement noise. It could be a system of process noise, could be a system of multiplicative noise or whatever, right? So this, the fact that this result is distribution free make sure you already include the process noise as well. Now, the same mechanism that I showed you here in the cost function, you can apply the same mechanism also to some type of chance constraint formulation. So a chance constraint also takes the form of, you know, minimize some expected value of constraint violation, but you don't know what the real probability distribution is, you only have samples. So instead of writing the chance constraint, you write the soup and then the chance constraint and you apply the same set of tricks again. And so you can, get, you can guarantee some probabilistic state constraints. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. And we will take the final question, Manish. Thank you for letting me ask. And thank you, Professor Doctor, for a very exciting talk. So in the collection of data, the YDUD, basically we are collecting enough data such that we have some kind of persistent excitation or situation like that. 
So in power systems, if somebody is collecting such data during the collection period, there might be some switchings in the model. For example, there could be a line switching. So how would you comment like if while applying deep sea, we are not aware of such switchings and we don't know what changes are happening in the model. So basically we have data from two very different model collected in the same matrix. Yes. So how would the deep sea still work or would it be still safe to apply it? Um, okay, so first of all, let me say, I don't have any theory certificate other than this particular robustness result that is through the regularization, you robustify yourself to nearby models. Okay. Meaning if you're lucky, then the change in model due to the switching is not so severe and it's included in your robustness radius and it's all fine. But what you should really do, you should, you know, run this recursively all the time. Ideally, you want to push this all the way to some sort of real-time adaptation. This you want to continuously update this trajectory matrix. Now, how to do this? We are working on it. <laughs> I don't have a good answer on this yet. But ideally, you want to push everything to the online stage, especially this trajectory collection. Thank you. Thank you. And then the challenge is, you know, typically time scale separation, right? You typically want to learn slowly and then control fast. And it's unclear how to do this. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So thanks so much again, Florian, for the wonderful talk and all the wonderful like Q and A's. So yeah, I, I guess like we are over time and yeah, let's end a seminar for today and look forward to seeing everyone in our next seminar series next Wednesday from uh, Professor Yu Songyue and Caltech. Okay. So. Thank you all. Bye everyone. Thank you, Florian.